couple things to share with you guys. First of all, in the front row, Jim it told me today it was a year ago that he had a stroke. Isn't he doing well? And, you know, we're to continue praying for him and asking God just to restore his life completely, you know. And, Jim, we just appreciate that you give the effort to come to church and, and that you're here in fellowship. You're such an encourager to all of us. Uh, the second thing, you know, by behalf of my family, uh, they were encouraging me, Terry, about your kidney that you share with the body of Christ. You know, I've, you know, I was pretty quiet about it. We go about it, and I'm a bit 100% approved by UCLA for a kidney transplant. I just need a donor. And so the, the deal is, is that we're also looking at scripts down in San Diego. And what we did is to write about it. It's a little bit in the bulletin, just kind of a little bit what's going on. We uh, have it up on the church website on the front page when you go down and you see my kidney story. And you can look at it and you can, well, what I ask of the Agape Chapel is to pray. To pray that God would either heal me 100% today or else that God would provide, make a provision through a kidney. Uh, I am in the A family and the O family, but that doesn't eliminate it. That's blood type. I'm just learning all these things, you know. And, and so, uh, but that doesn't limit uh, a donor from helping in that way. And so if that's you or if you know somebody. And, and what we're going to do is we'd like it to pass it around. Uh, we'll put it up on the social media, the link or whatever, and pass it around to your friends. And let's see what God might do. Uh, I spend about, I don't, my wife does, um, about 16 hours a week uh, taking care of me. And, and then you sit in the chair and they do all that washing of your kidney and clean, doing all that stuff. It's something to see and all that. But God has allowed me to be healthy through this and, and be in the pulpit, you know. And so that's your prayers. I'm standing up here because of your prayers, and I appreciate it. Let's pray for Jim and pray for this kidney. Lord, we just thank you this evening as we come before you. We rejoice. We rejoice so, so much to see Jim loving you, being an encourager. Lord, we ask that you might heal him completely of that stroke. Lord, we know that you could reverse things and just give him good, just all the doctors he might need or anything that he might need. But you could touch him tonight, and we're going to trust you for that. And then for as this kidney, you could do the same thing. You could com completely heal the ones that are in me, or else you could make a provision for a new one. And so we just praise you this evening, and we just thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, enough with talking about that. Let's go to the Daniel chapter 5 here tonight. Daniel chapter 5 as we continue through the Bible on Sunday night. In the fifth chapter of the book of Daniel, we come to the end of the Babylonian kingdom. In the great image that Nebuchadnezzar saw his dream, the head of gold and replaced by the chest and arms of silver, and that really was transition taking place in chapter 5. The transition is that Medes of Persians are going to come in and take over it, Nebuchadnezzar, of course, fought that in last week's study. He didn't want to. He thought the head of gold would last forever. But God had spoken to him, and eventually he buckled, and he realized the God of heaven rules over all. Isn't that a beautiful way? Especially when you look at our society and what's before us, elections and all that, then we realize that God's in control. That's where I bring great comfort to my own heart. It tells us in verse 1, Belshazzar, the king, made a great feast to a thousand of his lord, and he drank wine before the thousand. And of course, this was the time, uh, really, when Babylon began to be threatened by the Medes and Persian. Belshazzar, uh, really, he was led the troops against the Medes before. Babylon, when you think of Babylon, remember, Babylon's the country, it's also the city of Babylon. And so he went out into the country to face him, but he was beaten out, out there. So he came running back home to the city of Babylon because in the city of Babylon, they had enough provision to last for 20 years. Uh, the rivers Euphrates right, ran right down the middle of it, the city. They had plenty of water, plenty of food, these gigantic walls around it. 
that you could withstand a, a siege of many, many, many years. And so they felt very, very secure uh, within the city through the rest of the terror that was pretty much conquered by the, the Medes and the per, uh, territory was conquered pretty much by the Medes and the Persians. And Belshazzar tells us in verse 2, the beginning part, while he was tasting the wine, really a good translation was when he had become under the influence of wine. You know, when you start tasting it, you keep tasting it, you keep tasting it, eventually it has a side effect, you know. And, and though the merchant, uh, were, yeah, as I said, conquered the territory, he, he was seeking to affirm the gods of Babylon were greater than the God of Israel. He, because he will see the deliberate attack on the God of Israel because he he's taken the gold and the silver vessels that his grandfather Nebuchadnezzar had brought back from Jerusalem and from the temple there in, in Jerusalem and he's using it for worship of his gods. And he goes on in verse 2, Then they brought the golden vessels that were taken out of the temple of the house of God which, which was at Jerusalem, and the king and the princesses, his wives and his concubines, drank in them, and they drank wine, and they praised the God, gods of gold, of silver, of brass, and of iron, of wood, and of stone. In the same arm, as he, <laughs> this drunken, really, uh, party was going on, he, he says he was blasphemy against the true and living God. They came forth... Uh, there came forth a finger of a man's hand and wrote over against the candlestick up upon the plaster in the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw part of the hand that wrote. That would really, really sober me up. How about you? You know, they, they discovered the, the, there in a the place at Babylon, they had this really large hall when they kind of dug up and uh, and you know, even as the archaeological digs had been, they s discovered this large hall that was 52 feet wide, 100 feet something long. It was a good size banquet hall. No doubt this is where the party was taking place. And when the king saw this, really the phenomenon, the writing against the wall, just that finger going up against there, writing that, it, 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 his countenance was changed. It, it, rather than blasphemy God, his thoughts troubled him. In verse 6, then the king's countenance was changed and his thoughts troubled him. So the joints of the loins were loosened and his knees smote one against another. I've never been that scared. How about you? When your knees are knocking and they were quite afraid of what they were seeing. A tremendous fright seeing this hand come up. And, and at this time, an omen that he was seeing, he thought he was seeing. And the king cried out aloud to bring the astrologers, the Chaldeans, the soothsayers. And the king spake and said to the wise men of Babylon, Whosoever shall read this writing shall show me the interpretation thereof, and shall be clothed with scarlet, and have a chain of gold uh, about his neck, and shall be the third ruler of the kingdom." Why, why the third ruler? Because his father uh, was still alive. His father didn't spend much time in Babylon. He, he spent more time in, in Arabia where he was at. And at this particular time, Belshazzar ruler, was ruler and his father was off basically on a tour. He, he was comfortable being away from the city. Notice he called the astrologers and the soothsayer and so forth. We read... We read that he t uh, here took place in 586 B.C., 150 years approximately before this event. The in the book of Isaiah, 150 years earlier, it is his writing on the last days of Babylon. I find it's very, very interesting. You know what 150 years would bring you to in our country right now? It would bring you to 1874. What was happening in 1874? Think about it. There was a campaign called the Red River uh, War that lasted uh, this great conflict between the U.S. Army and the Southern Plains of, Indi of Indies, uh, Indians. The Medicine Lodge Treaty of 1867 was settled in of the S Southern Cheyenne uh, 
really the and the Comanches and the Indians to the Indian Territory. That's 150 years ago. 150 years ago in Chicago, uh, there was a fire in 1874 that uh, burned down 47 acres of city. Doesn't that sound like a long time ago? Destroying 812 buildings, killing 20. As a result, uh, they really, uh, really, really almost destroyed Chicago. In 1874, the United States election occurred in the middle of the Republican. Uh, uh, they elected this Republican fella. You know who he was? Think about it. U U.S. Uh, no, almost uh, uh, Ulysses S. Grant. That's 150 years ago. So we have in our story this beautiful story where Isaiah in chapter 47 it really was speaking so far in advance. I'll read a little bit of it ago uh, for you. You could turn with me to Isaiah 47. Come down and come down and sit in the dust, O virgin daughter of Babylon. Sit on the ground. There is no throne. He's talking about the fact that the throne was going to be vacated. O, o daughters of the Chaldeans, for thou shall no more be called tender and delicate. You're not just going to be a, a weak little tribe up there. Uh, the, take the millstones and grind the mill and cover the locks. Make bare the legs and cover the thigh. Pass over the river. Thy nakedness shall be uncovered. Yea, the, the shame shall be seen. As for our Redeemer, the Lord of hosts is his name, the Holy One of Israel. Sit thou silent and get thee into darkness, O daughters of the Chaldeans, for thou shalt no more be called the ladies of the uh, uh, kingdom. Remember, Chaldeans was uh, the forerunners of the Babylonians, but later on they became the same, the Babylonians. And he says, I polluted my inheritance and given them to thine hand, and thou did Show, uh, show them no mercy upon the ancient has thou uh, very heavy, uh, laid a heavy yoke upon them. And thou says, I shall be a lady forever, that Babylon should stand forever. Remember that golden Im image? That was the problem in Nebuchadnezzar. He thought his kingdom was going to last forever and ever. So that th thou dost lay these things to thine heart. Neither did you remember it, the latter end of it. Therefore hear now this, that thou art given to pleasure and dwellest carelessly, otherwise feeling secure, feeling the walls of Babylon. Remember I mentioned in the city, those walls were just tremendous. It's one of the you know, seven wonders of the world where the gates and all that of that city, uh, Babylon. And they thought they were so secure. Thou sayest in thy heart, I, I am and none else besides. I shall sit as a widow, neither shall I know, know the loss of children. But these two things shall come upon you in a moment, in one day. And for thus, uh, for thou hast trusted in thy wickedness, and thou hast uh, said, None seeth me. Thy wisdom and knowledge is perverted thee. Thou hast said in thine heart, I am none else besides me. There's nobody like me. Therefore shall evil come upon thee, and thou shalt not know from whence it rises. And the mischief shall fall upon thee, and thou shalt be, not be able to put it off. Desolation shall come upon thee suddenly, which thou shalt not know. The sudden attack that he's going to say uh, from this evading army that Babylon's going to see, and that sudden attack at our stories is we know it's the Medes and Persians. Stand now with thine enchantment, with the multitudes of sorcerers, uh, wherein thou hast labored from thy youth. And so remember, he called in all the, ch all the sorcerers and all that before him to give him answer, Belshazzar did. Thou art weighed in the multitudes of counsel. Let now the astrologers and the, uh, and the stargazers and uh, the monthly pro uh, procrastinators stand up and save thee from the th things that, thou, that shall come upon thee. It's interesting that's exactly who, who he called in our story that 150 years earlier in Isaiah, he's talking about this exactly about who he's going to call and what they're going to do. And he says, and the king offered his reward to whomsoever interpreted, interpreted this cryptic message. He wanted to know what it said. 
It was written in Arabic, and, it, and he didn't understand it. So as we go back to our story in Daniel, verse 8, Then came in all the king's wise men, but they could not read the writing, nor make known to the king the interpretation thereof. Then King Belshazzar, greatly troubled, and his countenance was changed in him, and his lords were astonished. He, he started to panic, really started to panic and take over because he didn't know what was going to happen to him. He became, like I said, very, very uh, sober. But now we see his the queen came in, and some guess that maybe it's the uh, wife of Nebuchadnezzar that could have been still alive. Maybe she was something in her 80s, or it could be actually his queen itself. It says in verse 10, Now the queen, by reason of the words of the king and his lord, came into the, uh, on, into the banquet house, and the queen spake and said, O king, live forever. Let not thy thoughts trouble thee, nor let thy countenance be changed. She said, she's trying to encourage him. It's going to be all right, grandson. It's going to be all right. It, 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 you have no problem. See, they, they were spreading around the past, uh, really the palace grounds. The word was going around, and so she came running in. See, the Babylonians were not really holy people. The gods were very uh, immoral. Their, their gods were very lustful. Uh, they, they, they were far from only holy. In fact, the holy God was rather strange concept to people. Even as you as a Christian, as you walk in holiness and you serve the Lord, you ever find people thinking that you're pretty strange, that you uh, believe in God's word? And you want to follow God's word of what he has to say? In verse 11, There is a man in thy kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. And, and, and notice that they say plural, but we know it's Jehovah. In the days of thy father's light and understanding and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods, was found in him whom the king Nebuchadnezzar, thy father, thy king, and I say thy father's maid, Masters and, and musicians, astrologers, and Chaldeans and soothsayers. So this man was marvelous. He had light. He understood. Speaking of Daniel, and he had understanding uh, that God had given us. And that's available to all of you, too. You know, the understanding, if any man lacks wisdom, James tells us, what are we supposed to do? Ask of God. And he'll give us to us freely and liberally, really just pour it out to us. As long as we ask. He says in verse 12, For as much as an excellent spirit and knowledge and understanding and interpreting dream of dreams, showing of the hard sentences and dissolving them, we found in the same Daniel whom the king named Belshazzar. Now let Daniel be called and he will show you the interpretation. Isn't that a great testimony that's uh, a non-believer saying about Daniel, it says about you. He's got an excellent spirit with him. His character w was honest, was trustworthy. And he says he not only that, he interprets dreams, he had understanding, and he was really a good guy. And so we know about Daniel that from his youth, he was committed to God. He was determined, remember in chapter 1, not to defile himself with the king's meat. He made that separation of who he was, that I'm not going to defile myself. Sometimes we have to make decisions not to defile ourselves with the, where we go, the people that we, that we eat and you know eat with. I remember when I was a young man, before I was married, I used to have roommates. And uh, they would come over to different guys would come over. This one friend of mine, he he would bring home these big old things of beer and put it in the refrigerator. I said, you can't do that. They go, well, why not? I'm thirsty. I work hard all day. I was sweating and all that. And I, I remember telling him, it's just because there's a lot of high school kids that stop by our house and they come in and if they open it up, you know who they're going to uh, think that has that beer in there? It's me, the guy that's teaching the Bible study. And, and then we go, well, Pastor Terry, or I was a pastor at that time. If Terry does it, then we can do it. The Paul tells us in the book of Timothy, B 
be thou an example of the believer in word and character and who you are. God's given you the Holy Spirit to enable you to be that example. But you know what we all need to do? We got to make a choice. We got to, I love that one where it says, remove thy foot from evil. And if you find you going down that slippery slope of uh, something that could pollute you or other people would say, you know, it's okay. It's okay if Pastor Terry goes to the bar with everybody after church. You know what? It's not okay because unbelievers are watching and they want to know what Jesus is all about and they're watching you. And so let's make sure that we do this and we follow the Lord. You know, and I lost my place. Verse 16. Let's do verse 16. And I've heard of thee that thou canst make interpretation and dissolve doubts. Now that thou canst read the writing and make known unto interpretation thereof, thou shalt be clothed with scarlet that would have chain about your neck and shall be a third ruler in the kingdom. You know, Belshazzar had a lot to offer him. He says, if you just offer me these things, uh, I'm going to make you head of everything. And Daniel answered and said unto the king, I like this, let thy, gifts to, uh, let thy gifts be to thyself. And give me reward, give the reward to another. Yet I will read the writing unto the king and make known unto him in interpretation. Daniel was probably quite old by this time. And he's now, you know, we only have one more chapter with him when, he gets thrown into the lion's den next week. And then the rest of the book is really uh, prophecies that we'll be looking at. So very old, and he's telling them, you know, I don't need your stuff. There's, and I like this, that he's really saying the servant of God is not for sale. Uh, we had a, a, a phrase that we learned to live by. <clears throat> if we take care of God's business, he'll take care of our business. If we trust him, we, we trust him and we're not begging and not selling out. The gifts of God are not for sale. And I love that. Be, beware of those who place such emphasis on your giving in order you might receive something from God. That I, I know that's a, a lot of times you've seen it. I've seen it myself on TV in different places where they're actually begging us to give money. I think it's better just to pray. And you trust the Lord for the expenses of what we're doing. God puts on people's hearts. We don't have to twist anybody's arm. Isn't that glorious? Just living for the Lord and serving him. Verse 17, uh, well, the latter part, it says, Yet I will read the writing on the king and make known him the interpretation. I like this because in the New Testament, when Simon trying to buy, buy from Peter the gifts, uh, who, whoever would lay hands, uh, on they would receive the Holy Spirit. Remember that in Acts, uh, where Acts chapter 8, verses 18 through 23. And Peter said to them, he says, your money perish with you, thinking the gifts of God can be bought. Daniel is a real man of integrity. And like I said, he's very old. And I think the older you get, sometimes the braver you get to stand up for the Lord because you don't have much time left. Let's, let's, do, let's go out serving Christ. Let's go out making good decisions. And Daniel says he will tell the interpretation, uh, but with one uh, preaching a sermon first, he first of all lays it on him. O thou king, Belshazzar, the most high God gave Nebuchadnezzar thy father a kingdom, majesty, glory, and honor. And for all the majesty that he gave him, all the people and nations and all language trembled in fear before him, whom he would he would sl slew or, or, or kill, and whom he would keep alive, and whom he would set up, and whom he would put down. When, when his heart was lifted up and his mind was hardened in pride, he was disposed from his kingly throne, and he took his glory from him. And of course, we saw that last week that happened. And he, he was driven from the sons of men, and his heart be, be, was made like a beast. And his dwelling was in, with the wild asses. And they fed him like grass, like oxen. And his body was wet with the dew of heaven. Until they knew that in 
the Most High God rule in the kingdom of men, and then he was appointed over, over it, whosoever he wills. He discovered that God reigns, that Nebuchadnezzar said that God's in control. You know, the, the sad part of this story is Nebuchadnezzar discovered his relationship with the Lord. Sometimes it doesn't get passed down to the next generation. And like I said, Belshazzar is his grandson and how they could miss the great call of God. Pray for your kids. Pray for your grandchildren. Tell them about Jesus so they could discover the Lord. And they too could become what we call a first generation, a real experience with the Lord, not living off of somebody else's relationship, but they themselves have their own relationship with the Lord. In verse 22, and thou, his son, O Belshazzar, has not again what? Humble thy heart, and though thou knewest all this. You're without excuse. You, this happened to your father. It's probably, you know, he was, Daniel was probably 14 years old when this happened to his father, very young. And what he went through and how he did not humble his heart before God. I think it's interesting the humbling of the heart is where you begin in your relationship with the Lord. It's where you continue in your relationship with the Lord. And what we should all really walk in is a humble heart. That God is, that we're serving the great God of heaven. You know, sin of ignorance are bad. But a sin against what you know is even worse. He says, he, even though he knew this, he knew all this, Belshazzar, he, he rejected what he had heard from his grandfather. That becomes a transgression. It's a deliberate, willful, willful transgression that you know better than it's sin. In your own conscience of the things that are going on, Ms. Nat's trying to get me up here. Verse 23, But thou hast lifted thyself against the Lord of heaven. They have brought the vessels of thy house before thee, and thou and thy lords, thy wives, thy concubines, have drunk wine in them, and thou hast praised the gods of silver, of gold, and of brass, and of iron, wood, and of stone, which see not, nor hear, nor know, for the God in whose hands thy breath is, and whose are the, the uh, in all thy ways, hast thou not glorified. I love it when in Psalm 115, in Psalm 135, the psalmist speaks about the gods of the heathen. He talks about them. He says, they carve them out of wood and stone. They have eyes, but what? They can't see. They have ears, but they cannot hear. They have feet, but they can't walk. Neither breath through their mouths. How are the men, men make gods and worship these gods uh, that they have made, 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 really made their gods? Isn't that true today? How men make things their gods? In fact, we like worshiping things. Otherwise, we wouldn't have TV programs called American Idol, would we? We want to find things to worship. We wouldn't have our favorite baseball team or football team. that People sat all day today and worshiped their football. And we want to find things. And the psalmist says they have made them become like their gods that they have made. Remember also when Elijah having a contest with the prophets of Baal. A beautiful story. And they prayed all morning for the gods of Baal to send fire upon the altar. And Elijah began to chive them and tease them like Elijah would. I like Elijah. And he says, I bet your, your God is asleep. You better cry louder and wake him up. You know, he, he's snoring out back. In reality, Baal couldn't hear. He had ears, but he couldn't see, or eyes he couldn't see. He couldn't respond. I'm glad I serve a God that does hear. You know, I think when you call out to the Lord, everything stops. The Lord listens down and says, yes, Terry, how could I help you? And it becomes very individual. And he listens to us. And he is alive to give me wisdom, to give me guidance. The God that I have is a personal relationship. And the God that's in whose hands uh, is thy breath. He tells us there, God upon whom we depend for our very life. He, he, we owe our life and our substance to God. 
if we're not, if it was for God, you and I wouldn't be here. He's the sustainer of life, and you praise all these other gods, but you have not praised or glorified the God of heaven. He says he's speaking to Belshazzar. In verse 24, then then was the part of the hand sent from him, uh, uh, from him, and the writing was written. And this is the writing that was writ written. Mini, mini, tekel, yafarsi. That's the interpretation of the thing. Mini, God has numbered the kingdom, and it is over. That's what it means. It's over. Your, your kingdom has come to an end. It was over. And Jesus said in the New Testament concerning the rich man who boasts in his riches. And he said, uh, and Jesus said to him, remember, he said, take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. And God said, you fool, tonight your soul will be required of you. And it was. And that's basically what the Lord is saying. It's over for you here tonight, Belshazzar. Tekel means, that in verse 27, thou art weighed in the balance, are found wanting. Oh, my goodness. The balance it was always used as a symbol of justice. Just like in the Supreme Court, if you go there and you see the, the balance and all that, the lady justice standing with the balance, the idea is balancing man's life of good and evil. In a biblical sense, your good works can never, ever, you know, counter your sins. I thought that's the way it worked. That God had a big white chalkboard up there, a big old chalkboard, had good on one side and evil on the, the other side. And I thought, if I knew I'd do enough good, it would uh, counterbalance all the bad I was. But there's no way that I could be justified by God by my works. The only ha hope that I have and the only hope that you have here tonight is through what? Through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Your sins are forgiven. You're justified before God. Justified to make it simple. Just as you never sin. As he takes us and he brings us to that beautiful place. Perez or, or the same as Euphrasis, which is a plural form. And there's sort of a, a is sort of again uh, comes from this to means that the word means divide. Your kingdom is divided. Verse 28, given to the Medes and the Persian, they then commanded Belshazzar that they would clothe Daniel with the scarlets and put chains of gold uh, upon his neck and made proclamation concerning him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. And that night, and that night was Belshazzar, the king of Chaldean, slain. Again, if we turn back over to the prophet Isaiah, it's very interesting as you read toward, uh, told, really he's told us about this last night when all the musicians and astrologers, Isaiah it has this tremendous insight what's going on in Isaiah chapter 45, verse 28. He says that, that says uh, Cyrus, he's my shepherd and shall perform all my pleasure, even saying to Jerusalem, Thou shalt build to the temple, the foundation should be laid. In other words, Cyrus would be that instrument that God will use to send them back from uh, captivity to Jews in Babylon. And so we remember this prophecy is 150 years earlier. How long ago? And he named Cyrus uh, by name. Who's going to be the guy? Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden to subdue nations before him. Cyrus was one of the leading generals when the Persian armies attacked, and the king, after the king had, had died, Darius only survived. He was only there for about three years after the captivity of Babylon, and he died at that point. Uh, Cyrus became king of the Medes of Persian, and it reads on, and I will loose the loins of the king. 150 years ago, he says he loosed the loins of the king. What do we read in our story that happened to Belshazzar when he saw the handwriting? His knees were loosened and they started to smoke one to another. Tremendous detail. And I will open before him the two levy gates. Around this great city with all the walls, one of the things that they had, they're, they're still in museums even this day, is the great gates of uh, on Babylon. The city was really on both sides were these great gates 
and what flew, flew really rolled through them was the re, river Euphrates. And he says, and I will leave open for you two levy gates and the gates will not be shut. And I will go before you and make the crooked place straight and I will break in pieces the gates of brass. Of course, the gates of Babylon were made out of brass. And he continues in verse uh, 45, verses two through four. And I will cut the asunder the bars of iron and I will give you and uh, thou makest known that I, the Lord, which is called by your name and the God of Israel for Jacob, my servant's sake and Israel, my elect, I, I have even called you by name and I have surnamed thee and thou has, has not known me. The story is that Cyrus came to Babylon and Daniel the prophet took the prophecy of Isaiah and he said, hey man, your name's in the book. He goes, can I sell you? And he pulled out the scrolls back to Isaiah and he showed him, he says, look at your name's here. It's interesting seeing that he was convinced that for that reason, he made a decree the Jews to return from captivity to go back to their plant, promised land. The prophecy was there for a reason, to convince, I think, really to convince Cyrus that God was in these people and to return them back to the land and, and, and back to where they should go. And again, the marvelous words of God, how we need to pay attention to them. When God speaks in such detail, I think he really wants us to know that God's word is true. From Genesis to Revelation, uh, we have the prophetic, uh, really there's over 300 prophecies in the Old Testament concerning the person of Jesus Christ. Because when Jesus came in with those prophecies, you have to be really ignorant. You have to really ignore that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. And finally in verse 30, in that night was Belshazzar of the, of the, of the Chaldean slain. And Darius of the Medes took the kingdom, being about three score and 20 years old. He just gives us a really a brief, well, concise history of the last night of the Babylonians. Now he begins with the Medes and the Persians. It wasn't too long ago as we were studying this great empire uh, of the Babylonians was in charge. But ultimately, God's in charge. It doesn't matter how great the nation might be. God still rules over all. In chapter 6, like I mentioned earlier, we get this fantastic story next week of Daniel in the lion's den. Come on out. There's some very interesting things for us to look at as we study God's word. Tony is going to come up and close us in a song. And we will, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, thank you this evening for the truth of your word. Thank you, you give us opportunity to minister and to help. I just pray for this week that we would walk with the consciousness of your Holy Spirit leading us to share, to talk about Jesus, that we won't give up on anybody, but we'll be there just ready to answer their questions, to encourage them, and to pray. We pray for our family members this evening, that they're, if they rebelled against you, that their hearts might be softened to hear your voice. We pray for our hearts. If we rebelled against you in any way, Lord, that we would confess it. Even as John tells us that you're faithful and just to forgive us and to call on righteousness. So again, we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Mm -hmm.